Hello, friends. Welcome to episode two of season two of the Audacity Channel podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk about microphone types, and we're going to look at the difference between microphone types and when and where you should use each type. So stick around. Hey, Mike Adams here with the Audacity Channel podcast. I want to thank you for joining me again on this episode. In the last episode, we talked briefly about room conditioning and how the room that we're recording in or the space that we're recording in is the first line of defense in preserving good audio. If our initial audio is recorded good, it means a lot less work for us in post-production. And in that episode, we talked at length about the importance of conditioning our room or our recording space to ensure good initial audio. Well, in this episode, I want to take that conversation a step further, and I want to talk about microphones. Because just like the room or space that we're recording in is important, the type of microphone that we're using in that space or in that room is just as important. A combination of the correct microphone coupled with the proper recording space is going to help ensure that our initial audio is the best that it can be. So when we talk about microphones, I guess the first thing we ought to talk about is the polar pattern of the microphone or the pickup pattern. Different microphones pick up audio from different directions. And when we talk about polar patterns, we're going to talk about two basic types. First, we're going to talk about the cardioid pickup pattern, which is also a unidirectional pattern. That is, the microphone is designed to pick up audio primarily from one direction. But then there's also omnidirectional microphones, like the Blue Yeti. And since we're talking now about Blue Yetis, let's talk about the bidirectional microphone, which is also an option on a Blue Yeti. An omnidirectional microphone picks up audio in a 360-degree pattern around the entire room or recording space that you're in. A bidirectional microphone, which the Blue Yeti can be optioned as, picks up audio from two different directions. It's primarily designed for two speakers sitting across the table from one another, where each has their own polar pattern on that microphone. A downside of an omnidirectional microphone is it's going to pick up all of the room artifacts. Everything in our room is going to be picked up by an omnidirectional mic. And to a certain extent, the same is true with a bidirectional microphone. A cardioid polar pattern, which again is primarily designed as unidirectional, to pick up primary audio from the front of the microphone is going to pick up less room artifacts than an omnidirectional or a bidirectional mic. In short, if the room you're in isn't fully conditioned for good sound and good quality audio, a dynamic microphone is probably the way to go because a dynamic microphone is going to reject noise from the sides and from the back. And in an environment that may have a little bit of noise, that's the option that I would go with. That's what I'm using right now. In addition to the polar pattern of the microphone that we choose, we can also choose a microphone that's either USB connected or XLR connected. A USB microphone will plug directly into our computer. This eliminates the need for an audio interface or a microphone interface. Remember, our computers can't do anything with analog audio. We have to convert that to digital in order for the computer to do anything with it. And a USB microphone does that internally. It has the circuitry within it to convert our analog voice signal into a digital voice signal before handing it off to our computer. Another advantage to a USB microphone, especially if you're just starting out, can be the cost of the microphone itself. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. A USB microphone will typically have a headphone jack on it somewhere where you can monitor the audio that you're recording with zero latency. In other words, you're hearing the audio as it's being recorded just the way it sounds as it's being recorded. And I always encourage you, if you don't already, to use headphones when you're recording audio for your podcast or audiobook. If you're not familiar with an XLR microphone, instead of having a USB connector on it, it has a three-prong balanced plug that will need to plug into your audio interface, and then the audio interface will be a USB connection into your computer. And in that instance, it's the audio interface or the microphone interface that's converting the audio signal from your XLR microphone into a digital signal and then sending that digital signal to your computer. So if you're using an XLR microphone, you're going to have to have a microphone interface or an audio interface to make it work. 
So with those initial thoughts behind us about polar patterns and about connection types, let's turn our attention to two popular microphone styles. The first is a condenser microphone. A condenser microphone is going to do a really good job reproducing your voice. But a drawback to using a condenser microphone gets back to our room or our recording space. If the room or recording space that we're recording in isn't conditioned very well, then that condenser mic is going to pick up those room artifacts and reproduce those. It's going to pick up the characteristics of the room more than a dynamic mic would. But a condenser mic is extremely good for recorded voice or spoken word recordings. A condenser microphone is going to also require 48 volt phantom power. If you're using a condenser mic with an XLR connection, it's going to require 48 volt power from your audio interface. That 48 volts is what powers the microphone, enabling it to function properly. Virtually every audio interface out there that I'm aware of can be optioned to supply that 48 volt phantom power if you're using a condenser microphone. If the condenser microphone that you're using is USB connected, then that 48 volt phantom power becomes irrelevant because it's supplied by the USB connection. A couple of examples of condenser microphones would be the Rode NT1. The Rode NT1 is a large diaphragm condenser microphone that's very good for picking up audio. It's an XLR microphone, and so it requires an audio interface, but it also requires 48 volt phantom power. Another good starter mic for a condenser microphone is the Rode NT-USB Mini microphone. The NT-USB Mini microphone is a USB condenser microphone. It's a really good place to start. It's a good introductory microphone if a condenser microphone that's USB connected is what you're looking for. And as of this recording, it's going to set you back about $100 US. You can pick up the Audio-Technica AT2020 condenser microphone for around $80 US. It's available as either an XLR microphone or a USB microphone. And it's a good entry level condenser microphone if that's something that you're looking for. If you're looking for a microphone that's maybe a step or two above entry level, the Sennheiser 416 microphone is another condenser microphone. It's a shotgun microphone, but it can be used in close proximity for podcasting and for audiobook narration. It's a little pricey. It's going to set you back about $1,000 US, so it's not necessarily an entry-level microphone, but it's an exceptional microphone. I couldn't afford the Sennheiser 416 when I bought my shotgun microphone, so I settled for the Cinco D2 microphone. The Cinco D2 microphone set me back about $250, and it's also a good shotgun microphone that I've used in the past for audiobook narration and for podcasting. I call it my Sennheiser 416 Lite, L-I-T-E, because I couldn't afford the Sennheiser microphone. But I like my Cinco D2 shotgun microphone. It's a hypercardioid microphone, which much like a cardioid microphone, it's designed to pick up audio from the front, but it also picks up a little bit from the sides and the back. But in the room that I used for recording audiobooks, that didn't matter because I had it so well conditioned. It was a walk-in closet. I talked about that in my previous episode, and I had a little bit of conditioning on the walls in addition to the clothes hanging there. And so that Cinco D2 condenser mic worked really good for me in that environment. I don't know that I would use it in a larger unconditioned room because, again, it's going to pick up all the artifacts in the room, being a condenser microphone. But if you have a well-treated room, it's a really good mic to use. It accentuates the lower tones or the lower frequencies of my voice, and so I had to do some EQing on it in post, but that's not a big deal. It's a really good microphone. Most condenser shotgun microphones out there are going to be either hypercardioid or supercardioid. And like I mentioned a moment ago, hypercardioid mics try to prevent audio bleed from the sides, but they pick up a little bit more noise directly behind the microphone. Supercardioid mics are more focused on the front than a cardioid mic, but just like hypercardioid mics, they pick up a small amount of audio from the back. And since we're talking about condenser microphones in this segment of the podcast, we have to talk about the Blue Yeti. A lot of people don't like the Blue Yeti. I'm not a big fan of it myself, but I have a friend who uses it all the time, and the audio that he creates is exceptional audio because he knows how to use the mic and his room is conditioned for that microphone. There's a lot of misconceptions about a Blue Yeti microphone. 
A Blue Yeti microphone has both an omnidirectional pickup pattern or polar pattern to it, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it can be optioned for a bi-directional setting as well, in case you have two speakers. The problem with the two-speaker thing and having the microphone sitting in the middle of the table is that it's hard to use or it's almost impossible to use good microphone technique because the speakers are a distance away from the microphone. And so there's, that's going to introduce a little bit of echo. That's going to introduce a little bit of uh, room artifacts, a little bit of room tone that maybe we don't want in there unless both speakers are kind of kissing the microphone and right up against it on each side of the microphone. I used to have a Blue Yeti, and I didn't really like it, so I ended up getting rid of it, but it can be a good entry-level microphone if you know how to use it. One mistake that I see Blue Yeti users uh, doing with a Blue Yeti microphone is that they'll have it set up for omnidirectional pickup, and then they'll tilt the mic toward them as though the top of the mic is where the audio is expected. But in a Blue Yeti microphone, you want that thing sitting vertical. If you point it toward you, with the top of the mic being toward you, it's actually picking up audio from your desk in the surrounding area. The polar pattern of a Blue Yeti is out the sides. It's not out the rounded top. And so when it's used in that matter, it can really create some problems with our audio. The Blue Yeti can also be optioned as a cardioid mic, but again, it gets back to using good microphone technique, which is what my friend knows how to do. Good microphone technique in that example involves remaining close enough to the mic and not moving around while you're speaking in order to reduce the room tone or the artifacts in the room that are kind of floating around waiting to get into your audio. This enables you to turn the gain down far enough to where you're not picking up a lot of room noise. So even though the Blue Yeti gets a bad rap in a lot of instances, if you know how to use it and you know what you're doing and your room is conditioned well enough to use it, then it can be a good microphone. And it is USB, and so you don't have to worry about an audio interface. And it's worth repeating, especially if you are using a Blue Yeti microphone, the importance of using headphones while you're recording, because you'll be able to catch any anomalies that are going on in your audio right away. So if your microphone that you're using is a Blue Yeti, do some research on it and make sure that you're using it correctly. You can get really good audio out of that microphone if you take the time to research how to get that good audio out of the microphone. So we've talked a little bit about condenser microphones and how they can be really good for voice recording. They're really good in any recording, really, if the environment allows for that. But let's talk next about dynamic microphones. Dynamic microphones are also referred to as broadcast microphones. Some entry-level dynamic microphones that you might be familiar with are the Samson Q9U and the ATR2100. Both the Samson Q9U and the ATR2100 have both USB and XLR capability on the microphone itself. That means that you can use either XLR or USB depending on your situation. And both of those microphones are really good microphones for podcast production. I think the Samson Q9U is going to set you back around $100, and I believe that the ATR2100 by Audio-Technica is going to set you back about $60. Don't quote me on those. I'm kind of running off my memory there. Another good XLR microphone that's really good for podcasting as well is the Shure SM57. Yes, that Shure SM57 has been around forever, but it's a really good microphone to use in podcasting. And along with that, the Shure SM58 is also good. I have, I think I have six Shure SM58s in my arsenal of microphones. And the reason why I had so many is because there was a time when I had to do a podcast with six individuals and I didn't have the money to shell out for some higher end things. So I got six Shure SM58 microphones and they worked terrific. But the SM57 is probably a little bit better than the SM58 in terms of voice reproduction for our podcasting. And both of those mics are good entry-level microphones if you're interested in them. I'll have links to all of these different mics in the description of this episode so that you don't have to go look for them. You can just click on that link. But to ensure full disclosure, those links are going to be affiliate links, which means the price doesn't go up on them. I just get a few pennies if you buy one using those links. If you're looking for something beyond entry level in a dynamic microphone, there are a lot of options. I'm using the Shure SM7B right now, which is going to set you back anywhere from $350 to $400 depending on whether or not you get it on sale. 
Another advanced dynamic microphone would be the ElectroVoice RE20 or RE320. Both of those are dynamic microphones, but they're not entry level. Again, that's going to set you back around $400 to $450 to get set up with that microphone. And an advantage of dynamic microphones is that they don't require phantom power. And they're typically really good at rejecting noise from the sides and the back. In other words, they're good microphones to use in a poorly treated room or in rooms with a lot of outside noise because they help reject that noise being cardioid mics that are expecting audio from one direction in front of the mic. But also be aware that some dynamic microphones like the SM7B, the RE20, and the RE320 that I mentioned are gain-hungry mics. In other words, they're going to require another piece of hardware like a cloud lifter that's put in line with the audio in order for the microphone to have enough gain to be able to be heard. I'm using a cloud lifter on this SM7B that I'm talking into right now, and that enables me to have my gain turned down real low. We don't want the gain turned up too high because we hear hiss, and we don't want that. So it's worth investing $150 or so to get something like a cloud lifter, which enables us to be able to turn the gain down on a microphone like the SM7B or the RE320 and get better audio. Also, dynamic microphones are less likely to pick up weird room anomalies than condenser mics. Remember, a condenser mic is very sensitive, and it provides extremely good voice reproduction, but it doesn't stop there. It's going to pick up everything in the room. A dynamic mic, on the other hand, is going to reject a lot of that room noise or a lot of those room anomalies simply by its design. One good factor to have when you're looking at purchasing a microphone or if you've got an existing microphone and you want to know how to EQ it is to get a hold of the frequency response sheet for that microphone. Now, not all microphones come with a frequency response sheet, but you can usually Google it and find one out there somewhere. The frequency response of the microphone is going to show you what frequencies it accentuates and by how much or how many dB, and it's going to show you where the frequency rolls off. And you can use that as a rough guide when you're applying EQ for the first time to that microphone. For example, if you're using a microphone that has a lot of high-end gain in the frequency response and your voice doesn't do well with a lot of high-end gain, you can equalize some of that out of there in post-production and in so doing, make it fit your voice. The same is true of the low end. I mentioned earlier that my Cinco D2 microphone accentuates the low end of my voice more than I want it to, as does this Shure SM7B. But in post-production, I equalize or I EQ that back out. And the way that I know it does that is by looking at the frequency response sheet, the spec sheet, on the microphone. And again, that's a really good way to initially determine how much equalization you want on your microphone and whether or not the microphone is going to work for your voice. So we talked about condenser microphones and we talked about dynamic microphones. We talked about the different polar patterns in this episode. We talked about the different connectors that are used, USB or XLR. And I gave you some microphones to consider that are both entry level and beyond entry level. And again, I'll have links to those in the description of this episode. And just a reminder that later on in episode five, we're going to be talking about audio interfaces or microphone interfaces and what they do and how to use them. But in the next episode of this season two of the Audacity Channel podcast, we're going to talk about microphone placement. So that's coming up as well. Hey, just a reminder, it's March Madness at the Audacity Boot Camp. March Madness means 50% off the courses that I teach at the Audacity Boot Camp. And that 50% off offer is good for the entire month of March. To take advantage of that 50% off March Madness deal at the Audacity Boot Camp, simply go to audacitybootcamp.com and enter the code MADNESS, and you'll instantly get 50% off each course there. I'll have a link to that in the description below as well so that you can just click on it and go. When you get there, you'll see both of the courses that I charge for, which I don't charge very much. I mean, we're talking $99 for one of them and $79 for the other. And now you get 50% off for the entire month of March. That is madness. That is March madness. And once you're there, you can look at each course individually. You can see the full curriculum of videos. And there are some videos that you can sample for free before making a decision so that you know whether or not this is a good fit for you. 
So I hope you'll take advantage of my 50% off March Madness Mania and head on over to audacitybootcamp.com and take advantage of that. So I will see you next week and we'll talk about microphone placement in our room. I'll see you then.